I invite you to now just begin to just gently close your eyes and just begin to plant your feet firmly on the floor and just start to go within and begin to really connect with that heart space. That heart space where we begin to find love and we begin to just Feel, feel that interconnectedness and that oneness to every living being that we share this planet. And in this moment, I invite for you to envision the word or the feeling of harmony. Maybe thinking about what it feels like to be in harmony with everyone and everything. Bringing all aspects of your being into harmony. Knowing that when we have internal, internal harmony, we're better able to create peace and harmony in the world around us. With harmony, we're better able to notice conflict in our relationships and to be able to take a look at how we can contribute to bringing it all back into alignment. Gently offer, offering our harmonizing support. With harmony, we look for sources of agreement and accord, enabling ourselves to better find the harmony that exists beyond any perceived differences. With harmony, we appreciate diversity and we create a more beautiful symphony in the concert of our lives. I now invite you to begin to bring the word focus into your mind. beginning to realize that what we focus on expands. We choose to focus on what is good and what is beautiful in our world. Focusing with gratitude on what we have in life, rather on what we feel we may be lacking. Noticing that in the process of acceptance, many blessings come our way.
when we focus, we turn our attention to solutions rather than problems. We take action knowing that it is a form of focus that leads to manifestation. Knowing that what we apply our attention to increases. Focus allows us to find our center by focusing on the spirit within. And as we prepare to enter into our moment of silence, I invite you to keep these words and these, the feelings that they evoke, harmony and focus in your mind as we enter into our moment of silence. And as we begin to bring our attention back to this present moment, we celebrate this present moment. We celebrate all the harmony that is found in this present moment. The focus on this present moment. And we celebrate the life that is happening and the life that is in this beautiful present moment. And we breathe in and we breathe out. And we acknowledge so it is and so we allow it to be. Namaste. ourselves to continue to sit in this present moment, to just really feel this present moment, all of the light that it contains as we sing our new Lord. Oh wait, there you are, never mind. So since a majority of our congregation is online this morning, I assume everybody, most everybody got the message that we had to close the sanctuary again, but you know, we're going to get through this together. We may go through a few ups and downs through this time, but, you know, hey, we're navigating it together, and that's what matters, right? Our community, that's what we're here together for, and we support each other, and we're going to continue to do that. So thank you all. As Josie mentioned, thank you all for hanging in there and for bearing with us as we go through this. Like I said, we will get through this all together. So, and hey, I mean, what a perfect book study for this, you know, welcoming the unwelcome. It fits, right? I mean, it just completely fits right now, so perfect timing. So we're already on chapters 9 and 10. You know, it's a, it's a short book, but it's a very powerful book. 
I mean, this thing packs a lot of punch. And I'm so glad that Pema came out of her, her time of silence and decided to write again because it's just so needed right now. But she starts off chapter 9 and she refers back to a topic that we have mentioned several times um, during the course of this study. And it's that word again, that polarization. That word just keeps coming back up, doesn't it? Kind of makes me think that maybe we should just kind of wake up a little bit and start to pay attention. And I have to admit, you know, I've kind of shared a little bit, bit of this with my small group. But, you know, I have to admit that I've personally, you know, met some of the things in the book with a little bit of resistance. I mean, there's been some things in there I'm like, whoa, I'm not ready to practice that yet. You know, I'm just, I'm, you know, no matter how much I'm enjoying the book and how much I truly believe in everything that she says and teaches through the book, I've met some portions of it with resistance. You know, I, I think some, you know, probably for all of us, sometimes it's just somehow easier to blame people that we see as the other side of things. It's like, well, I don't want to take any responsibility for that. I'll just say it's those people over there on the other side, you know, of things that are, that are causing these issues or whatever. But, you know, because it certainly helps remove my own responsibility. I mean, doesn't it for all of us? Hey, it's just easier. Hey, I'm not responsible for that. It's your fault or your fault. I'm not going to take any blame. But remember last week's reading, or last week's uh, reading in the book was she talked about our comfort zones. You know, we talked about how staying in our comfort zone, although it might be nice and warm, it doesn't always offer the best opportunity for growth. It might be warm and cozy there, but it really doesn't challenge us that much. You know, and it can also kind of help us to shut out whatever might be going on outside of our comfort zone. You know, a place where we can shut out those things we may not want to face. Or those things that may make us feel uncomfortable. Our comfort zone allows us to be able to do that. So on some of those things, I've personally felt resistance because there are a lot of times lately I've realized even with myself, I don't want to leave my comfort zone. Now maybe especially today because it's a little cold outside. It might be nice to kind of stay in there, but, but it's probably true for all of us. Most, you know, lots of times we don't want to leave our comfort zones. Many of us feel a bit of respite in those comfort zones because we feel comfortable. However, remember that Pema also mentioned that our comfort zone can also begin to shrink. They can begin to kind of start to close in on us a little bit. Before we long, we see it start shrinking so much that we find out that there's no room to stretch out. And that warm air that we're all in there cuddled up with kind of starts to crack a little bit. And that cold air starts to seep in. And when this happens, we find that we have no choice to be thrust out of our comfort zone into the next zone, which is the learning zone. Now, this is where the change starts to happen. It's in that learning zone that the real, true change begins to happen. So today, wherever you are, whether you're sitting at home in your living room, whether you're you know, in a closet watching this, whether you're here in the sanctuary today, I invite you to be willing. To be willing to at least for a moment just to step outside of your comfort zones. To be willing to walk with me in some of those things that you may find to be uncomfortable. To, willing to, to be willing to walk with me into a new way of being. A new way of thinking and a new way of seeing. So I ask today, are you ready to do that? Now last week I mentioned a show that Mindy and I, we've started to watch on Netflix. And it's a, it's a show and it's a really good series and it's called Ozark. And it starts. It stars Jason Bateman. He's still around all this time. He's still around. But anyway, it stars Jason Bateman. It's about money laundering and these other criminal activities. But it's a really good, captivating show. Anyway, there's this character, and her name is Ruth. And her father's a convicted felon, and she's supposedly been raised to just believe that her family and all future generations of her family are just not really destined to achieve very much in life. You know, that they're destined to just live in states of poverty and really nothing else. And you can tell that Ruth really doesn't really, she doesn't seem to really believe this about herself, though. Her character continues to develop, and you can tell that deep down she believes otherwise about herself. She believes that there are great things that she can achieve and great things that future generations of her family can achieve. And this includes her teenage nephew that's currently living with her. She wants him to go to college, and she's really encouraging him while he's in school to get good grades and to really apply himself. So he comes home from school one day, 
And she finds out that the school guidance counselor has pretty much just written him off and given up on him just because of who his family is. So Ruth decides she's going to go up and she's going to talk to the, to the guidance counselor. And the counselor sees Ruth and she remembers her from her own days in school. She remembers Ruth, you know, from just, Ruth's probably only, what, 20 years old and she remembers Ruth from her own days in school. And it's obvious that this counselor just holds, just seems to perpetuate this idea that Ruth and her family are just not going to go anywhere in life. And that they're just dead and to li- destined to live these poverty, criminal-ridden lives. And the counselor flat out tells Ruth, she tells, the counselor tells her that her job is to select the winners. And it's just a show, it's just a series, but it made me think about how often this happens in real life. How people focus on what they perceive as negative rather than focusing on the good in another person. And the possibilities that lie within each and every one of us. And how our speech, how our speech and how we communicate to another person can so deeply affect another. Now Pema talks about this and she says, We all have basic goodness which naturally responds to the basic goodness of others. But the right conditions have to be there for this positive inclination to come out. How we communicate is crucial. When we set ourselves apart and speak from our neurosis to another's neurosis, we create further division. But when we come from a place of shared humanity, our speech can have the effect of healing. For me, this is the meaning of bodhi. Sattva. I think that's how you say it. I look at Pete to help me with some of this. Bodhisattva speech. So Pema mentions Bodhisattva speech. And this is speech in which we communicate respect for each other and for all things around us. Respect for both ourselves and for other people. And we use Bodhisattva speech. When we do this, we avoid things such as aggression. We avoid disrespect and we avoid polarization. We're able to do this with Bodhisattva because it's speech, but it's speech not from the ego. It is speech instead from the heart. And it moves us back into the basic goodness, back into the alignment of that basic goodness that we truly are. Now we all know what it's like to get wrapped up in our emotions And to begin to feel worked up, as Pema puts it. She mentions how when we do this, we begin to lose our perspective. We may even begin to use speech such as those people over there. Or those people over there. I mean, I know I've done that. I know I'm guilty of doing that. We all have at some point or the other likely done that. At least on occasion, but it's just really not helpful. That's why yelling and screaming does anything but help a situation. It's creating this division of, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, so get over it. But it doesn't help anything. I was just called a name this past week because I refused to denounce bigoted actions of a politician. And trust me, that didn't help the situation, and it certainly didn't make me want to sit down and attempt to hold any true dialogue with this person. That name came out and I shut down immediately. I wanted nothing more to do with the conversation. That conversation in my mind was truly over the moment I heard myself called that name. Because that name used was of a, of a very divisive nature. And it immediately created a you versus me in a them versus us environment. And it was anything but helpful. Now, Pema mentions, sometimes we have the best intentions to bring about positive change. But we're too caught up in our ego clinging to carry them out. We're too triggered to have good judgment. In these cases, our speech and our actions are more likely to divide than to unite. So, and I know this feels very difficult right now. Especially when we feel we're watching what we feel is a moral decline and social injustices that seem to be happening all around us. Does it mean, though, that we just sit within our comfort zones and pretend that those things don't exist? I mean, we hear about how peace and all is always found within rather than in out in circumstances. So does this mean we just ignore it? 
it absolutely does not mean we just lock ourselves into our comfort zones with our fingers planted firmly in our ears, trying to block it all out. Even Pema addresses this. She mentions that we don't avoid addressing those outer circumstances. Remember I mentioned it last week, the land of rainbows and unicorns. How we wish everything could always be within the land of rainbows and unicorns. But we have to be willing to come out of that if we want to make change. We don't walk around forever in that state of just la, 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 just pretending that it doesn't exist. That's toxic positivity, and it really does not help anything. Pema mentions in the book, This isn't to say we should avoid addressing outer circumstances. Parents, for example, need to guide the behavior of their children. And there are far too many injustices in the world. But if we're to speak in a way that actually helps, we first need to work with our own propensities when they are triggered. Then, if we want to become activists, we can be more effective because we'll enter situations with a clear head, not blinded by anger or other emotions. If you have no intense feelings about lip-smacking, but think that it's in everyone's best interest for the person to stop, you can say something and your words are more likely to be well received. Earlier in the book she mentions lip smacking, how it can just you know, irritate you, so that's kind of where that is. But she mentions the Dharma always brings us back to ourselves. Before we can heal others with our speech, we need to get a handle on our own mind and its propensities. So how then do we begin to get a handle on our own mind and our propensities? She first mentioned self-reflection. Now I read this at first and I thought, oh no, there's no way I'm anything like those people. There it went again. There that came back on me again. Okay, so maybe not with some things, but possibly with other things. You know, in other words, it doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything another person says or does. We can still recognize our interconnectedness despite those differences despite those differences that are really more of something of a human nature versus a spiritual one, right? But looking around me, I see groups of people all over right now who are being forced out of their comfort zones. I think every one of us has been forced out of our comfort zone this past year. But guess what? We're all frightened right now. Every one of us are frightened right now, maybe in different ways, but we're all frightened right now. I don't have to agree with everyone. I don't have to agree with the words and the actions of everyone. But I can at least begin to take a look at myself. And to catch myself if I feel I'm being rigid or judgmental of other people. If I'm saying them, them over there. Realizing that I've done this hasn't been easy. Self-reflecting on that behavior hasn't been easy with myself. It's something I've had to come to terms with. And it's something that we all must come to terms with. Because self-discovery is raw and self-discovery can be very painful. But trust me when I say, however, fighting that pain, resisting that pain should be the last thing that you do. We should instead make the decision to sit there and to welcome the unwelcome. To welcome that uncomfortable feeling. Pema mentions a great Buddhist sage who suggests that we remain like a log of wood to prevent ourselves from escalating. And he's not saying we just forget, you know, any humanity or any of our spirituality and just remain, you know, passive. It's not that we block out our feelings when we do this. We just don't immediately act or speak as these feelings start to come up. Pema says that instead of reacting, we rest with the moving heightened energy that has arisen we let ourselves just experiencing what we just experience what we are experiencing when we remain like a log of wood and this helps us to allow that vulnerability and when we do this we begin to speak from the vulnerability of the heart because from the heart is where we begin to heal it's where we begin to heal rather than to divide where we begin to use speech that connects to our inner connectedness. To maybe then begin to look at those we perceive as others and say, you seem like you may be feeling fear. You seem like you may be feeling a little frightened right now. You know what? 
So am I. How can we start to overcome this together? How can we join hands and walk through this together? And I'm not saying, I'm not at all saying that it's wrong to stand up for what is right. Because we should, and we should continue to do that. But we can also make sure that we're doing it from the right place. That we're coming from the heart when we do this. Now, Pema also encourages us to watch how we label things. And I'm going to say that we've been seeing a lot of that lately, right? A lot of labeling going on out there. All we have to do is look at certain Twitter accounts to see how this fire is being fueled by so-called leaders, right? Of course, I'm also not innocent in this myself. Probably a majority of people in the world tend to do it. We tend to label things. That's just how our minds tend to work sometimes. Even Pema admitted to it. Again, anytime Pema admits to some of this behavior, it makes me feel a lot better. I'm like, okay, if she does it, it's okay to slip occasionally. But she talked about her time at a new abbey and how she, walked, she thought the place was just dirty. She's like, I don't know what they got going on here, but their cleaning habits are not that good. But she said the kitchen was her biggest sore spot. And she talks about how it even drove her down. She even snuck down in the middle of the night to clean it. And she said she was even caught one time and was really embarrassed. But then she caught herself and she began to realize that how we label things is how they appear to be. She said that she decided to conduct an experiment. And she said she did this to, to, or she, um, said this to herself. I don't care if the whole place is a mess. I'm going to work on my propensity to label things in negative ways such as dirty and disorganized. So she decides she's going to begin to pay attention as how she projected her own version of reality onto the world. She started to notice that the kitchen didn't seem as dirty as he, how she originally had thought it to be. And it didn't mean that it had necessarily changed how dirty it actually was. It didn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, cleaning fairies were going down in the middle of the night. But she said the actual cleanliness may not have gotten any better, but her perception of it did. And it helped her to relax and to be a happier person when she was in the kitchen. She says, I felt much better, which made everyone else feel less tense, which improved the atmosphere overall. So again, though, this doesn't mean that we just let outer circumstances go. You can't just allow dirty dishes and old food to pile up in the kitchen and ignore it by saying, hey, I'm changing the way I perceive it. You know, I get the feeling you may not be, have a very happy spouse, partner, or roommate if you choose to do that. I know I wouldn't, so I would not recommend it. But Pema touches on this. She says, to see that how we label things is how they appear does not mean that we stop working with outer circumstances. Often external situations do need to be changed in a concrete, reliable way. She goes on to say, otherwise there would have never been any civil rights movement or any other actions by heroic bodhisattvas who are inspired to help at the outer level. And she also mentions political change. But we can't make political change happen if we don't first start the work inside of here and inside of here. It begins here first. It begins inside first. We must first begin to notice our own projections, our own propensity to label things. We must ask ourselves how we are labeling those things that we see around us. For to do that is to wake up for the benefit of all living things. She also mentioned ways in which we view other people, especially during those times we feel wronged by another person. She mentions a verse in our book. And the verse says, even if someone humiliates you and denounces you in front of a crowd of people, think of this person as your teacher and humbly honor them. Now she's not suggesting that, suggesting that we stay in toxic or abusive situations. We shouldn't do that. That's not what she's saying. She's meaning more along the lines of those things that others do that truly irritate us. Those things that make you think of the scratching of a chalkboard. But she mentions the realization, or she talks about it, you know, realizing maybe that you have a pimple on your nose. You know, you got to go meet with a bunch of people that day, and you're like, oh, no, this big pimple's come up on my nose. You start putting makeup or whatever it is you're going to put on it trying to hide it. You know, you do the works. And you take a look at yourself in the mirror, and you're like, you know, I've done a pretty good job. You can't even see that pimple anymore. 
I feel pretty confident to go out and talk to this group of people. Only to get out into the middle of that group of people and a child walks up and says, Ooh, what is that big thing on your nose? You've got a few choices here when that happens. You can burst into tears and decide that you're going to just head straight home and hide back in your comfort zone where it's warm and cozy. You can berate the child, telling him or her to just go about and mind their own business. Or you can view that child as an opportunity to take a good look at ego. Maybe the child is showing you that you need to just loosen up a little bit, just kind of go with the flow. So what if you got a pimple on your nose? People will remember you at least. But maybe that child is showing you that you are resisting what is. That child has just become one of your greatest teachers in that moment. And what is it that a lot of these teachers are doing? They're pulling us out of our comfort zones, aren't they? They're helping us to expose those things that we may most want to resist. Even that dirty kitchen that Pema mentioned and the monks who were helping to keep it that way. They were some of Pema's biggest teachers in that moment. Because face it, if it hadn't been for that dirty kitchen, she may not have become aware of labels the way she became aware of labels. The family member who grates on your nerves at Thanksgiving, which is coming up, because they chew with their mouth open. Maybe it's time to learn a little bit of tolerance. And of course, these are small instances, you know, but and much larger things can happen. Much larger things that are a little bit more painful that happen to maybe where people come into our lives to be our biggest teachers. But what if some of those things that cause us the most distress are indeed our greatest teachers? Even now. I mean, think about it. Is the pandemic perhaps one of our greatest teachers? It doesn't have to just be a person. It can be a situation. And although so many of us have a difficult time with it, what about political administrations? Maybe they happen to show us that despite circumstances that are happening we're still going to practice love. That we're still going to help other people. That we can stand together in nonviolence. So to end, I just want to let you know, we, we all know we've got a very busy week ahead of us, right? We've got a very busy week. A lot of people may be feeling fear. You may be feeling a little bit of stress. And we've got a very trying week for groups of people who currently feel marginalized by current politicians and other groups of people. Many of us feel fear right now. Many are worrying knowing that it may be increasingly difficult if things stay the way they have been since late 2016. Many fear where another round of that may lead us. I've also felt fear, but you know what? It's true that we don't know what the outcome of this is going to be. But I do know this. I do know that we're going to navigate this together. No matter what the outcome is, we are going to navigate this together. We're going to step outside of our comfort zones because that is who we are. We're going to step outside of our comfort zones into our learning zones. And we're going to continue to help those that feel that there is not a place for them in this country. Immigrants and even our own people in this country. We're going to help all of them. We're going to step outside of our comfort zones and we're going to help them because that's who we are. We will stand and we will not falter or we will not fall. We will learn to navigate whatever happens together. We will make ourselves vulnerable because in that vulnerability, we're going to help others to be able to find theirs. We're going to stand together in peace. We're going to stand together in love. And we are going to stand strong together in nonviolence. Because I promise you, we will stand. Namaste. And now we're going to have our special music a little bit earlier today. <laughs>